Thank you very much, Mr. von Schaulemer. I would like to give you a minute to clear the panel, um, as our next distinguished speaker is already waiting in the wings. Uh, if, we, yeah, if we summarize, we'll have a, we have a Eurobonds uh, as a poisons pill, and uh, we have a, a little bit of rough waters ahead. Um, not here at the summit. <laughs> And uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon Stefan Ingves. Stefan Ingves is the chair of the Advisory Technical Committee and a member of the General Board of the European Systemic Risk Board. He will now give us a better overview of the macroprudential risk management in the new framework. Stefan Ingves, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, uh, so, deswegen, uh, to, uh, to speak here, the the issue is uh, the state of the union, and it's the state of the banking union that we're actually talking about here today. And I think that that's a, it's a timely theme, and it's a timely th theme for this conference, uh, both when it comes to macroprudential policy and the various joint efforts that we're uh, undertaking presently to uh, safeguard financial stability in uh, Europe. And in this respect, actually, 2014 is a milestone in terms of both legislation and a milestone in terms of the tasks uh, that are, are ahead of us when it comes to dealing with uh, all of this. In my short introduction, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the new rules of the game, so to speak. Uh, some of the new uh, rules of the game for financial markets from a systemic uh, risk perspective. And I'm going to especially highlight the role of the EU's macroprudential watchdog, the Frankfurt-based European Systemic Risk Board. And uh, the ESRB is not only central uh, when it comes to identifying and warning against risks in the EU financial system, it's, uh, it also plays a very key role in implementing the new macroprudential framework uh, across Europe in different countries and also for Europe as a whole. In addition to that, the role of the e ESRB will also be to actually assess to what extent the national policy, policy measures are being taken and if, uh, if countries are doing uh, enough. A new uh, regulatory landscape is taking, shape, uh, is taking shape, and that's what we're discussing here today. That happens both at the global, the regional, and the national uh, level. And to some extent, many of these things have already happened, uh, but still a lot of work lies, uh, lies ahead. And what we have to do here is to update our roadmaps and thinking, think about how to navigate and how to navigate these uh, new uh, landscapes. All the new rules that are being put in place in one form or the other uh, are, are there to make financial institutions safer. Uh, but I do think, though, that not all crashes can be avoided, uh, but hopefully in the future they can be less severe and also actually less, uh, um, less uh, frequent. What we have learned and what many have learned before us over the, o over the centuries is that a serious financial crisis can be very costly to society as a whole. And uh, to avoid that, we need to spot difficulties as early as uh, possible. One very simple way of explaining what macroprudential policies is all about is to say it's about to take away the punch bowl before the party gets going. It's not really harder than that. And then, of course, an issue in itself is to really make it happen. Now, uh, all of these issues, they are important both to regulators and to bankers uh, alike. In my role as the chairman of the Basel Committee, uh, I deal with these issues uh, with a global uh, scope. In my position as the governor of the Swedish Central Bank, I deal with these issues from a national perspective. 
But today, when I'm talking about this, uh, this topic, uh, I'm here in my capacity as chairman of the Advisory Technical Committee of the European Systemic uh, Risk Board. And I'm also a member of the, of the decision-making body, the general board of the ESRB. And that means that uh, with that hat on, I'm talking from a, a European perspective uh, today. Uh, to some extent, these perspectives are actually more, more or less the same in the sense that uh, what happens on the regulatory side, being at the global level, European level, or national level, all these uh, uh, issues are nowadays uh, intertwined. What we try to achieve at the global level is to get to a point where we have a, re a reasonable set of minimum uh, requirements that countries or jurisdictions are expected to uh, adhere to. We also hope to achieve a reasonably level uh, playing field, while at the same time it's hard to get around the fact that uh, there will always be, I think, some uh, national uh, flexibility that will be needed in one form or the other. But regardless of the perspective, whether it's global, regional, or national, the whole issue is always to safeguard financial stability and make sure that the financial system uh, stays uh, safe. Now, not many good things have come out of the financial crisis. But one thing that maybe wasn't so bad after all was that we had to learn the hard way that our system had some serious weaknesses and that we uh, needed to start building uh, something better. Now, in doing so, in carrying out the work, there are a number of issues uh, that we need to be mindful of, and let me, uh, let me run through a few of them. First one is, of course, uh, which has been discussed at length uh, by others by now for, for years, the need for sufficient capital in the banks, and also the need for liquidity buffers in, in case you end up with uh, outflows. Second issue is that we need to be able to identify, to monitor, and assess risks. And we need to get better at doing this, uh, especially from a system-wide uh, perspective. But to do that, we also need to develop a toolbox. We need to develop new tools that we have maybe not always, at, or at least not everywhere, uh, used uh, in, the, in the past. And we also need the institutions in place uh, to manage uh, those tools. And finally, we also need to be able to evaluate uh, uh, what policy actions have been taken and to what, ex uh, what extent they were actually efficient or, or, or not. There are very many pieces to this uh, puzzle. As an aside, I think that in the last Basel Committee meeting, we had about 500 pages to deal with, with technical stuff. So there are many, many pieces to this uh, puzzle. But one part of it is to deal with systemic risk identification and assessments of uh, systemic uh, risk. And this is where macroprudential uh, policy framework becomes an issue, both uh, uh, at the pan-EU level and in different, uh, different countries. And this is where the uh, European Systemic risk, risk Board can play a role and has a, a play, uh, has a role to play. And since I'm wearing my ESRB hat today, I'm going to run through some of the tasks of the ESRB, explain what the ESRB has been doing and will be doing in the, in the future, uh, where the ESRB is just one of many EU institutions. Uh, legally, legally, the ESRB is an independent EU body tasked tasked with safeguarding the stability of the EU financial system. The ESRB has no binding uh, powers, but it can issue warnings and recommendations to national authorities, and it can actually also issue warnings and rec recommendations to other EU institutions. And all of this is uh, done according to the principle comply or explain. This principle just simply says that either you do as recommended or you explain publicly why you don't do as recommended. Now, uh, so far the ESRB has uh, issued a number of uh, recommendations of this type, for, ex for, ex for example, in areas such as uh, money market funds, funding of credit, institu funding of credit institutions, US, US dollar denominated, de denominated funding of credit, credit institutions, lending to households in foreign currencies, and particularly on mandates for 
and intermediate objectives and instruments for macro prudential uh, policies. Now, particularly when it comes to the last uh, recommendation, the one on macro prudential policies, the ESRB has a role to play when it comes to supporting its members' countries in implementing uh, macro prudential uh, policy. The ESRB also has a pan-European role when it comes to developing uh, additional analytical tools uh, when it comes to looking at what, uh, how you actually execute macro uh, prudential politi policies, what they mean, and how you kind of give this some, uh, some uh, content. Now, a core task of the ESRB is to identify potential risks uh, to the EU financial system uh, at an early stage, actually, actually at an er as early a stage as uh, possible, and then recommend policy uh, actions. Now, in this, uh, I think that the ESRB really benefit benefits immensely from its broad composition of uh, uh, members. Uh, the ESRB is unique in Europe in the sense that it brings together representatives from central banks and financial super supervisory authorities in all 28 uh, uh, member states, as well as actually representatives from the three European supervisory authorities, the European Commission, and from the EFC. Now, the decision-making body, the general board, actually given so many institutions, has about 70 people on the, around the table. We can argue about that, but on the other hand, everybody is there and every angle of the financial system in Europe is actually covered. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, the ESRB has every, possi every possibility uh, with its uh, very, very broad expertise uh, to recommend and comment on uh, what, is, uh, what is going uh, on. But uh, not only the ESR membership is, is broader compared to many other e EU institutions, the ESRB also has a broad mandate. And that's because uh, the ESRB uh, is uh, tasked with overseeing the, e the financial system covering banks, insurance, shadow banking, markets and financial institutions. That is essentially every financial activity that's going on in, in Europe. And in addition to that, the ESRB has also been tasked with uh, trying to understand uh, the linkages and the dynamics uh, between the different uh, uh, parts of the financial sector in, uh, in Europe. Now, to do that, that means that it's the job of the ESRB to connect the dots, so to, so to, so to speak. That's hard to do. Uh, but we are working hard on figuring out where the dots are, and we're working hard on trying to connect them. Uh, but that will probably take, uh, take, take some time when it comes to fully understand at each moment in time what is going on in the European uh, financial sector. Now, when it comes to international work, back a bit to that, a lot of it has centered around what, what, ha what came to be called uh, Basel, Basel III, and that's kind of the international uh, reform agenda. Now, moving to the EU level, a landmark, uh, which I'm not going to talk about here today, is, of course, uh, the banking union and the single supervisory mechanisms. Other ha mechanism, other ha others have talked about that earlier, earlier today. But in addition to this, and this is where Basel III turns into something, something European, is the Capital Requirements Directive, the CRD, and the Capital Requirements Regulation, the CR CRR. This legislation, these pieces of legislation, they actually provide uh, macro uh, prudential authorities in all of EU countries with a set of policy instruments uh, that can be used with legal support when it comes to conducting uh, macro, macro prudential policies in countries. What this actually means, looking into the future, is that now we have reached a fork in the road uh, when, the, when the time has come to operationalize macro prudential policies at the national level and to try to apply these tools in practice, which mostly in most countries, this has not been done in the, in the past. One example is the, is the so-called countercyclical capital buffer, and it's a good example because it shows, uh, it shows us very, very clearly that we need 
uh, a common standard and that we also need a level uh, playing field when it comes to using this particular uh, instrument. But at the same time, if you look at what's going on in different countries in Europe, it's also very, very clear that the credit cycle is not identical uh, throughout Europe. In some countries, credit is shrinking. In other countries, credit is increasing. In some countries, uh, maybe even too, uh, too, too rapidly. And that means that, uh, that uh, it will take some time before everything is going uniformly in the same direction in Europe. And it's hard to tell if that ever will happen in the near, in, in, in the near future. Now, given the, given the differences, but given at the same time the need for a common understanding how to do these things and the need for more uniformity, this clearly uh, creates a role for the European Systemic Risk Board to keep track of what's going on and to give guidance uh, when it comes to what countries actually are, uh, are, are doing. Doing this, though, is, is really breaking new ground because the ESRB has existed in roughly three, three and a half years. Uh, we have spent that time together with uh, national supervisory agencies, central banks, and others in different parts of the world discussing the concept of systemic risk and macroprudential uh, policy. Now, by now, we have esta established a number of, let me call them well-established concepts. But when it, when it comes to actually implementing these tools and using them, uh, most of this is still in its infancy. One reason for that is that in many countries, it's just now when I stand here and, and talk, that the legal framework is being put in place in countries and, and where, they are, where we start putting in place the organizational frameworks that you actually need in order to pass judgment on what is going on and, and in order to make decisions at the, at the national uh, level. And here again, as I said, uh, guidance from the ESRB uh, can be very uh, valuable and, uh, and useful. The ESRB has already issued uh, recommendations on national macroprudential uh, mandates and in various ways uh, supported uh, members when they do this uh, work. Quite recently, actually, the ESRB produced a handbook with uh, quite detailed guidance uh, when it comes to implementing macroprudential uh, measures. This is a document which is a long one, a couple hundred pages. Uh, but that's, uh, th so this is kind of the, what I call macroprudential plumbing. And the devil is in the details uh, when it comes to doing some of, uh, some of these uh, things. Uh, but by producing these type, uh, this type of background document, our hope is that the ESRB can help countries uh, when they think about what to do at the, at the national uh, level. Also, the new sets of rules coming out of CRR and CRD are, uh, brings new specific uh, roles to the ESRB in this, uh, in this uh, context. For example, when it comes to the countercyclical capital buffer, it, the countries have to notify the ESRB before they put the countercyclical buffer into effect at the, at the national, uh, national level. And that means that going forward, the work of the ESRB will take on actually a quite specific uh, legal, uh, legal meaning. What that also actually means is that the ESRB as an institution has to have the capacity to judge uh, what countries are about to do in country X and has to have the capacity to opine on that and, and argue uh, whether it is good, not so good, or whether more or less uh, should be uh, done. And that means that presently we are in the process of uh, constructing and building a decision-making process uh, that will take care of this issue uh, for uh, all the EU member, uh, member countries. And that's clearly brand new because we haven't had that kind of a system in the, in the past. Now, when it comes to tools, and there are many of them, uh, and, and some of them are listed in, in both Basel III and the CRD, uh, CRR, it's very, very easy to spend a lot of time on an individual tool, thinking that that will solve every imaginable problem in the, in the world. I think that more often you'll find that you actually need to combine different tools in such a way that you come up with something that's uh, reasonable when, when, uh, in terms of defining uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed in the, in the financial sector. Basically, what we're talking about here is uh, 
to define and specify what kind of constraints uh, there should be out there and to what extent and how banks uh, should have to adhere to them. And, and that means that uh, it's too easy to say that if we find this secret knob, we turn it twice, every problem will go away. The world is just much more uh, complicated, uh, complicated than that. And I think that that holds particularly when we talk about macroprudential uh, policies because it's an entirely new field and it hasn't been uh, uh, tried in the, in the past. Now, having, uh, having noted that, uh, let me then say that, uh, as I started out saying, that the regulatory landscape is presently changing. And it's quite rapidly actually finding its uh, shape and form. And uh, I can understand if you are in the private sector because th that people can sort of say, do you never ever get done? I think that the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that uh, the reality that's out there, the reality that we are set uh, to manage changes constantly. And that means that uh, our understanding also what, what is going on uh, changes over time. Uh, so uh, we are going to have to update our roadmaps as we go along. And particularly when it comes to, let's say, macroprudential that I'm talking about here today, it's a new field. A new field almost by definition means that there will be substantial learning by doing. It is not possible to know everything ex ante. Uh, so we just have to go along and uh, keep a close track of what works and what does not seem to work and then adjust these systems uh, over, over, uh, over time. There are many issues to be dealt with and to pass judgment on systemic risk and to make systemic risk assessments, that's not so easy to do ex ante. It is always easy to do ex post because that we know at least those of us who are a bit older and, and seen many things go wrong in the, in, the, in the past. But I do think that the ESRB is making good progress uh, when it comes to dealing with, the, with these uh, issues. I do think that the ESRB can be a catalyst in the European conversation about how these things uh, should happen and, and, and come about. But at the same time, uh, whatever is being put in place won't be perfect from the start. Uh, but at least I think we can come closer uh, and be safer uh, than what we have been in the past. Uh, but I'm convinced that it will also make our ride less uh, bumpy. But we cannot avoid all the crashes, but we can maybe elimin eliminate uh, a few of them. And uh, quite a few nuts and bolts were missing when we started out. We have produced a number of them. Uh, now we have actually to put them into good use. And I do think that if we do that, and if we continue the work that we do on the public sector side, uh, we have set the preconditions uh, for avoiding uh, catastrophes uh, in the future are actually uh, there. And I think that uh, that uh, bodes well for dealing with issues in the future, despite the fact that uh, we will never know exactly what is uh, around the corner. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Stefan Ingves. May the punch bowl become an endangered species at financial parties under your shrewd stewardship. Thank you very much for your notes. Um, I think um, we will continue with our, with our panel. We are very happy to have you join us here at, at our panel. Um, and hopefully later on I have a few more questions to be able to discuss with you. Let me at that occasion also introduce you the next chair of the panel, which is Thomas Cross member of the board of the Hessischen Landesbank, who, by the way, is the person who deals with that several hundred pages of technical notes which you are issuing. <laughs> so let me welcome Mr. Gross. <laughs> well, please uh, take a seat. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted uh, and honored to, to chair that uh, panel here. You already, uh, let's say, see the names, uh, and I think 
it's rather uh, difficult to introduce them because a lot of them are very well known to us. Nevertheless, uh, maybe just a few uh, words uh, to uh, Dr. Andreas Dombret, who is with us this afternoon. And he, after having uh, had some leading management positions in different banks uh, now since 2010, he is member of the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank and since very, very recently also responsible for banking and financial supervision as well as uh, risk controlling. So welcome this uh, afternoon. <laughs> Shall they get in? Oh, okay, good. Uh, the next one is uh, Dr. Arno Gerken, uh, director at McKinsey Company for more than uh, 20 years, so a long-serving uh, consultant. He is leader of the uh, global knowledge uh, segment of, of their risk practice. And obviously, he advises banks, insurances, but, and maybe we can learn something from that perspective, uh, he also works for oil, gas, and energy companies. Uh, next one uh, in our round is uh, Professor Dr. Jan Peter Kranen, uh, here uh, at his home turf, professor at the House of Finance uh, at the Goethe University, obviously, chairman of the Center of the Financial Studies and a member of some commissions, uh, and just uh, mentioned too, uh, he was member of the Lee Canning Commission, as well as member of the Academic Council of the Ministry of Finance uh, here in, in Germany. And last, but definitely not least, a warm welcome to uh, Larry E. Thompson. He is the general counsel of the DTCC, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. He works with uh, them for more than 30 years, uh, has a lot of experience uh, in that area, and is also co-chairing their internal risk management uh, committee. So once again, uh, welcome the uh, panelists to a hopefully a lively discussion. And in order to be uh, lively, hopefully, uh, you, you know the format that uh, we will start out uh, with maybe two or three uh, questions. And I urge you first just to answer with yes or no. And thereafter, hopefully having a diverse set of answers, we can uh, go in those uh, topics which we have different, uh, let's say, uh, views. Um, I think you mentioned, uh, Mr. Engwes, that you're beginning. The reality is changing and still complicated. I think everyone uh, does agree. But based on that, uh, the question, do we need unified risk assessment models uh, to explain the complicated world? No. Nope. It's yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. No. Okay, so this is a good question to dig in uh, later on. Uh, and the second one, we are talking about systemic risk. Uh, has the systemic risk uh, been increasing over the past three to five years? Also, once again. Maybe. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe is the answer, yes. <laughs> That's a good answer, I think. <laughs> it would be good to know. <laughs> no, at least not currently. Definitely, yes. Good. At, at least some, <laughs> some different uh, perspectives. So uh, maybe we uh, just take that uh, two questions, and uh, I would uh, then just uh, ask you, also starting uh, on that side of the panel, to, to give some, uh, let's say, reasoning why you think, uh, uh, what about the unified risk models uh, and maybe also the systemic risk part, uh, the maybe uh, answer? Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I just told uh, Mr. Kahnen, I was recently at a conference and somebody said, um, my secretary told me I'm supposed to speak for 45 minutes, but she misunderstood it was four to five minutes. So I, I'm prepared uh, for four to five minutes. Yeah? Yeah. I hope that's right. Yeah? Um, now, with regard to the risk models, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that um, my colleagues and I um, at the Bundesbank, we are believers um, in inverted commas in risk models. We think that uh, they're never going to be totally correct, but they're... Um, the right approach to use them. Now the question was, do we need unified risk models? And uh, my answer was no, because I think if you have unified risk models, what you are basically promoting is um, a herd behavior, uh, which you have if all banks do the same. 
and are very predictable in what they do. Also, I wonder whether we do want to lose the institute-specific risk perspective. Um, so this is the, these are the two reasons why I said um, um, we don't need them. Having said that, though, is I would like to add that I am concerned about the variety in results uh, some of these internal risk models produce, and that I am an advocate of uh, counter-checking you know, the work of risk models, uh, for example, through leverage ratios. So there's a limit, and that's why Stefan Ingves, of course, with the maybe gave the right answer, but I only thought about this with my second answer. With regard to the uh, has um, systemic risk increased or not, uh, is a question, first of all, whether you can measure systemic risk appropriately, and uh, you probably sort of can. If you can measure it, you can sort of also price it. Um, that's a big statement. It's not easy to measure, and as Stefan English just said, it's uh, especially difficult ex ante. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> uh, I think you can measure it over time, and you can also measure it by saying which institution contributes probably how much to systemic risk. Um, the systemic risk um, from uh, single institutions probably has, uh, as Larry said, at least recently, recently decreased. But we still have uh, the risk of the system be affected. So I was not, I said maybe, because I do think that there are still risks in the system which we don't contain and where we still need have work to do also with regard uh, to the FSB and other bodies in order to make sure that we really capture it. Four to five minutes. Do we need uniform models? We need a bit of both in the sense that banks do many different things and you can approach risk in many different ways. And that speaks in favor of using many different types of models. But having said that, what you need in addition to that is transparency. And you also need simple models uh, that are transparent so that you can kind of compare while at the same time banks decide to do what it is that they will prefer to do. And for that reason, for example, the leverage ratio was mentioned. That's a sensible way of going about because if this is done in a transparent way, then it's up to market participants to decide for themselves so that there aren't really black, black boxes out there. But it is an issue, though, presently, to deal with this whole issue of, of how banks calculate their risk weights, because there is a perception out there uh, that there are too many degrees of freedom, and that runs the risk of creating the idea that banks can completely on their own decide their risk weights. And then, of course, that creates a scenario where risk weights go down and regulatory capital goes up while you just kind of deal with the numbers. And that's not really ac acceptable. So. Uh, we have to think about uh, constraints on the models that are being used and constraints such that everybody who is involved in this business can understand what is, uh, uh, what is going on. The other question, can systemic risk be priced? I think we can do that, but, but of course, very hard to come up with sort of a number with seven decimals. And, and that's really the hard part. That, that, but that doesn't mean that we should give up. We do know, uh, as Andrea said, what the costs are ex post. And there are two types of, two ways of looking at this, at least. One is to think about the cost at the kind of an, at the macro level. And that, there the cost is loss of output. And we're talking about negative growth in a country that runs into a systemic banking crisis of, let's say, three to five years. And we can measure that. We know roughly what that cost is in most cases. Then another aspect of the whole thing is more what I can, tell, what, what I can call the accounting cost. That's how much money an individual bank loses uh, when, it, uh, when it goes under. And we also actually know those numbers fairly, fairly well in terms of uh, how much money did, did banks lose on average, large banks, small banks, uh, different types of banks in different, uh, different financial crises. And that also means that those numbers tell us something about what kind of safety measures uh, that we need to take in order to ensure that things don't go, uh, go, go totally, uh, to totally wrong. But having, and, and that then determines, of course, what kind of buffers that we need in the, in, 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 in the system. But having said that, uh, these measures will probably never be precise because countries are different, financial systems are 
uh, financial systems are different, uh, and things vary, uh, vary over time, but we, uh, we shouldn't give up. Uh, because we also know from history that we tend to say that this time is different and we tend to ignore numbers from the past uh, But we should never forget because we do know that these uh, these disasters uh, strike from uh, time to time Okay, thanks. So unified models at the first question Yes, so I had said yes uh, we, we should and we I think we can and uh, this is not a, a minor issue which which may be interesting besides many other issues that need to be toppled uh, covered I think that's the key issue of what we have to deal with in the future um, just to make uh, the statement clear I think that the only reason why we are currently so much worried about the stability of the financial system is systemic risk. It is not about the fragility or stability of individual institutions, because with this, we, I think, giving the banking union project, we can deal now. But we have to be able to resolve uh, banks individually without having these repercussions on the entire system. This is systemic risk. How can we get rid of it? I think the only way forward is that we get an understanding of what produces the degree, let's say, of systemic risk or the level of systemic risk that we, that we observe. And we don't know much about that yet. We even don't know how to measure it. I would agree with Stefan Ingves in an ex-ante sense. We know it basically in, an, in a concurrent sense. At the very moment, we have measures that rely on prices. But what we really want to have is a model of systemic risk that works on structures rather than on prices so that we can have some ability to forecast and that we have some ability to improve our financial system. The, bank, the way banks are set up, the amount of capital they have, the interlinkages they have, etc., that might lower the level of systemic risk. For that reason, I think we have no choice other than establishing a way to estimate the level of systemic risk. This is the unified model I speak about, and this is quite a big research endeavor which many institutions now try to deal with. So that would be my, my take. I think we have to do it, and we can do it, and we are doing it actually, more or less in labs now in the research area, and the OFR, the Office of Financial Research in the, in the US, is working in this direction, and I'm sure that ESRB has a lot of activities that try to capture that number. So there was a strong uh, yes, uh, we need it, but a kind of maybe <laughs> with the impact of uh, systemic risk uh, and the increase of it, if I recall it right. Yeah, right. The point is we have no clue to measure it. So it's very difficult to make a statement, yes, it increased, or no, it didn't. <laughs> I think we should be able to do that, and I, I could talk about gut feelings, but not about anything that, that I know. And for that reason, um, uh, these two questions, in my uh, opinion, are closely uh, related. Okay, so m maybe then I just pick uh, the, the later question, because you said a clear no, and you a yes, so uh, you can't uh, give an answer, but you both uh, gave an answer in a different way. So, uh, Mr. Thompson, why uh, are you convinced that it did not increase? Um. Well, I, I think on the issue of systemic risk, can it be priced? Uh, I agree with the professor that the first measure, and I think everybody agrees, is you've got to figure out how to measure it. And I think there are a number of ways that you've already identified that you can measure it. But I think actually what you want to be able to do is forecast where the systemic risk is coming from. And in order to do that, you're going to have to be able to figure out what are the measurements of systemic risk. Um, and I agree that the OFR is working in that, in that uh, way. We're, we're actually working very closely with them. But in order to price it, you got to be able to have a clear measuring stick that everybody agrees to. Uh, and in order for that to happen, you're going to need tremendous coordination among all of the global regulators in order to have the sufficient information to effectively implement the tools designed to identify and mitigate systemic risk. So you got, you're going to need legal entity identifiers because you're going to have to know clearly what are we talking about in terms of the legal entities that we're dealing with in the system uh, and what are the connections that those uh, entities have among each other. Uh, we're also going to need tools designed to improve market transparency, which is one of the reasons that I said yes to the question about unified risk assessment tools because that is a way to get transparency into the system so that we can all understand what's going on. It has nothing to do with 
uh, the business models that the banks adopt. The banks can adopt all of the business models that they want, but we should be able to measure across the board, whatever their business model is, what is the risk that they are bringing to, not only to themselves, but also to the system itself. And the only way to do that is to agree that this set of measurements in unify that across all of the, the issues together. So one of the ways to do it is by getting data from trade repositories. Uh, we, we have a number of them on a global basis. And to make certain that the regulators have the tools, uh, the analytical tools to take that data uh, and to be able to analyze it in a fashion where the data becomes information. And that information becomes useful not only to the prudential regulators, but also to the market regulators and equally to the market participants. So that's the reason why I had such a strong yes. And just the opposite on both questions. Uh, yeah, um, Mr. Gagne. there's of course a reason why you put those two questions together. Um, so let me start with the modeling bit yeah, and share with you an anecdote. This is late 2007. Uh, we were talking and uh, working extensively in the US already on subprime mortgages workout. And I was sitting in a board, and I knew they had a pretty significant exposure to subprime mortgages, uh, so credit derivatives. And I said, look, I mean, shouldn't we pay close attention, understand your risk exposure, blah, blah, blah. Then the CRO spoke up and said, look, yeah, all my numbers display, and he really pulled it out, yeah, all my numbers do display that everything is in order. And the models they were using are pretty similar, or were using are pretty similar to what we today would call the standardized approach. Now you add this and, and say, um, so that tells us a little bit about the limita limitation of models, right? Now you add this and say, no, everybody will have to behave the same way as per those models. And we believe that those models, because we report accordingly, these models are, will represent the truth and the reality. The consequence will be that um, hopefully we have a little bit more insight in the future, of course, right? But the, uh, the consequence can easily, easily be unidirectional behavior of all market participants. That was my point. And if there's one issue that uh, we learned from the crisis, it is that there was markets completely eroding and going away from one day to the other due to lack of trust and lack of capability to position paper. And as a consequence, uh, thankfully, the ECB and other uh, institutions had to step in to stabilize the banking system. The second observation I would like to make is we always have a little bit of a bias here to focus on banking and banks. Yeah? We know today that, of course, interconnectedness of what we are doing, what we are talking about here, is going significantly beyond the inner limits of the banking system. Yeah. Not only, by the way, to the insurance, asset managers, and pension funds. When you talk, to, talk about uh, what's going on in the corporate sector, many corporates, in particular in Germany, have significant liquidity holdings by now, uh, are almost acting like near banks. In fact, many are setting up their own banking operations as we speak. So in that sense, um, there's also a question around what is the remit? What are we going to look at? Um, so, uh, my comment indeed is um, on the model side, uh, Mr. Gross, I would indeed say, of course, you need transparency, I can only concur. And of course, you need for external reporting and uh, reporting to the ECB, to the Bundesbank, of course, you need some common standards. Yeah? But would I say that each institution should have the same kind of model and apply it? I would say definitely no. There's a big risk in it, quite the contrary, and I'm happy to elaborate on it further. And I understand I also have to stick to the four to five minutes time frame. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and therefore the systemic risk uh, has increased. Yeah, I think there's an underlying trend which is almost uh, overlaying what we're doing in regulation, which is interconnectivity in the whole system, and that's why a systemic risk is increasing. Uh, I would say, indeed, judgment is open, uh, Professor Kran, and whether, um, due to regulation, uh, we are now increasing it significantly or not. Uh, as I said, I do see a couple of elements here which, indeed, are tending to increase. So the counter-cyclical buffer question is also one that I would like to discuss here. I don't know whether you have time later on. Um, but, um, 
in principle, there's also, of course, a lot of good things happening here on the regulatory side, yeah? But there's an overarching long-term trend, uh, which I do see, that cuts definitely beyond the banking industry, uh, where interconnectivity is, is increasing. And by the way, just to highlight uh, that this is not only, we always have a little bit of bias to look at the issues of the past, yeah? What about cyber risk? You know, the interconnectivity that we are having on the IT side. Yeah? If we have a major attack that not only attacks one bank, fortunately that's what happened in the past, but attacks the whole system. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe picking up the, I think you called it, uh, potential hurt behavior and therefore also some uh, risk out of that uh, some uh, different view on what has been said on, on this side or some he was, remarks? Uh, this was exactly my argument. If everybody is going into, this, into the same direction and you leave out the institute specifics, you run a risk in itself. So I think that uh, uh, that is not something um, because the underlying thinking is do sup are supervisors the better bankers? Um, I think they shouldn't even get close to this point. So there must be a market-driven, institute-specific approach where you need the transparency, where you need the guidelines, where, you know, of course, the, um, the fact that the results of risk models are so white make me uh, wonder, pretty much, and also concerned, but I don't want, we have exactly the same point so the two extremes have the same point. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> so you, you stated the supervisors <clears throat> as a question, are those the better bankers? Uh, are the professors are the better bankers? Herr <laughs> Kran? Well, um, this is a rhetoric question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think one, one remark to what um, Andreas Domrett said. Uh, what, what is the role of, um, of these risk models and what is the role of the supervisors here? I think. I, I wouldn't care about these risk models of individual banks, whether, whether they are similar or not, as long as I know that the systemic risk level is low. Because then banks can fail if they do it wrong, and even many banks can fail if they do it wrong. And the only thing is, it shouldn't be almost all banks at the same time. That's the only thing that I'm worried about. The rest, the market can sort out, and I don't think the regulator needs to have a close look into the risk management capacity of banks. As long as we know systemic risk is low, then market discipline could work. In some sense, we have completely forgotten about market discipline in banking because we don't trust it anymore. And my point about this unified model for systemic risk was really about how can we get market discipline back to work? And that is rule out systemic risk and the rest the market will do. Okay. Well, interestingly, I think we have discussed about can systemic risk be priced, uh, did it increase? But do we have the same understanding of what systemic risk is all about? Probably. Um, I, I thought you were asking uh, yeah. Stefan Ingves. Um, sure. Probably, but... Uh, because you had oh, a clear yeah, maybe. Yeah, hard to yeah. say. Yes, we do in the sense that We do know what happens in countries when you get a run on the whole banking system, and we do know what happens and how you deal with it and how these things tend to evolve. So in that sense, it, there's a pretty clear understanding of how these things evolve. What, what is hard to deal with is to stop it early enough, because one way or the other we seem to make the same mistake over and over again, and it's very basic and it's very simple. Somehow, mysteriously, we tend to think that the sky is the limit, and we, when, when, when that's the way we look at it, somebody is creating too much leverage somewhere in the system, and we find out way too late. And that's when everything goes south, and very, very quickly. And that's what's so hard to, uh, so hard to deal with. And that's where this whole issue about saying, well, you know, how much leverage should we tolerate? And, and, and why is it that we shouldn't go beyond whatever that number happens to, uh, happens to be? So that's a simple way of doing it. If we don't do that, if we allow highly, highly levered systems, then the consequence of that is a very large number of other constraints. Because the more leverage you have, the more leverage you accept, the more dangerous it gets, and that over time tends to produce other types of constraints hoping that the whole thing will hold, hold together. I, I, I agree with that analysis, but I, I was going to say there's an element that we all tend to forget about, which is 
Human beings tend to be herd animals. And once the herd starts heading in a certain direction, it continues in that direction. And so what you saw in 2007, 2008, was a fundamental run on the bank led not necessarily by each one of these factors, but by a lack of trust in the system. People did not feel that they had transparency into what was going on, and that led to a lack of trust, which led directly to a run. So if you're gonna be dealing with the issue, you're gonna stop the herd from moving in a certain direction, you gotta have transparency into the system. You really need to have the elements where you fully understand what is it that we are trying to measure and how are we measuring it and are we making certain that the public and the regulators, but equally the market participants, trust the information that they're receiving. Yeah, uh, if I can compliment that, that's exactly what I agree with. Transparency on flows, transparency on exposure. That is indeed fundamentally important. And uh, we just did a survey uh, with institutional investors whereby we systematically ask, in light of R&R development, recovery and resolution developments, um, how do investors currently view the banking uh, community? And the good news is that indeed through all these preventive measures, the trust in the banking system has gone up quite substantially. Um, I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that this is not necessarily preventing us from another crisis. Yeah? But it is indeed, uh, to your point, a, 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 for, the, for the moment, a very good achievement that I would agree with. Yeah. Right. Some adds on? I would just like to add everything we've said, I agree with, and I would like to add that, of course, there are some known unknowns in banking and there are unknown unknowns and we can sit here and debate and then uh, things come out uh, of a totally unexpected direction and then I don't want hurt behavior. Um, <laughs> we, you, you know, in every trade you need, a buyer, you need a buyer and a seller, you need a taker and a seller and uh, it's important that we have that and that we are not, uh, that we're not promoting pro-cyclicality where we don't need to. Okay, so because I think uh, there are a lot of agreements right now on, on the statements, uh, we can enlarge uh, the discussion, uh, let's say, from the panel also to the audience. Um, so please uh, feel free uh, to ask your questions and if you might direct uh, someone directly, it makes us easier uh, to get it answered. Please, who wants uh, to ask the first question? Hi, Charlie Haswell from HSBC. Three quick questions, if I may. Um, first of all, does systemic risk tend to originate in asset classes or institutions? Secondly, which is it that we should be watching? Systemic leverage or systemic risk? And then finally, and this is really for Stefan, um, Stefan, Victor Constancio um, spoke at a conference in this town um, just a few weeks ago and argued very, very strongly that macroprudential policy should be operated at the center by the ECB. Um, I've just heard you say very persuasively that credit cycles across member states are not synchronized and therefore arguing pro possibly for national operation of macroprudential policy. When you and Vitor get together, what does the conversation go like? <laughs> okay, so maybe we start with the, the third one. Okay. Uh, well, we're talking about actually two different things because it's a fact that credit cycles are different in different countries in Europe and, and that we cannot change. You just look at the numbers. So the other issue is then, if we start from that, what institutional setup do you use to come to a point where you actually make macroprudential decisions? And that can be either made at the national level or it can be done by the ECB. And now we have kind of a sort of a compromise solution where national, it's done at the national level, but the, ES, ES, the ECB has the right to, do, to demand more if a country is not doing Doing, uh, do, doing enough. But just the fact that credit cycles are different doesn't mean that, uh, it, 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 that you have to come to the conclusion that it has to be at the national level. It can be done in many different, different ways and as usually happens in Europe, then you come up with a bunch of different, uh, different compromises to, to, to hopefully make it work over time. Good. May I pick the first question and turn it, uh, let's say, to you where the, the, the source of uh, systemic risk uh, is uh, probably located, institutions or asset classes? So, 
I mean, it's clearly institutions, because this, what we think of systemic risk as a definition is that a large share or fraction of the financial system breaks down at the same moment. This is and has real effects. Right? So that's the systemic risk that we face, and it's all on the institutional basis where risk gets consolidated and either leads to default or not. And that is the level that we have to control, I think. And that would also explain why it's not systemic leverage, but it's systemic, uh, uh, systemic risk uh, that really matters in this definition. Right? That's why our, all our concerns about um, uh, policy on the micro level, but also on the macro level, is directed towards institutions and not towards asset classes. Is there a general agreement uh, on that? It's a little bit of a hen and egg uh, discussion. Uh, where does the risk come from? Um, it comes, of course, from the asset class very often, and it's then uh, becoming uh, dangerous in the institution. So there is no disagreement with what Mr. Kranen said, but uh, the subprime uh, real estate sector was clearly an asset class, but it was uh, uh, then um, in some institutions who bought it. Uh, not everybody bought subprime. Um, and not everybody warehoused subprime. So it's a, um, I'm not so sure it's going to help us in uh, uh, finding out where the next crisis can come from. Uh, although if I can build on this, I would say the asset classes are the transmission mechanism mm -hmm. uh, for the institution. Yeah? And in, in that sense, uh, it is very important to look at the asset classes because let's be clear, yeah? my point around not being limited to the remits of the banking system itself is of course an argument that builds on asset classes, right? We all know that uh, when it came to Italian government bonds, when it came to Spanish government bonds, that this was not only a banking issue, right? Fortunately, it was not covered so broadly in the press. You know? Otherwise, we could have been in much more trouble uh, a couple of years ago. Yes. So in that sense, I would say it's both, um, but usually in most cases, it starts off three asset class. At the same point in time, when we talk about unidirectional behavior, we can also now argue it's, it's uh, institution-driven because we suddenly force all institutions in the same direction. Yeah, so, to some extent. Yeah, I, I do know that we have not answered uh, all three of the questions, but uh, for time reasons and a benefit for others, uh, maybe uh, there are other questions, and thereafter we can get back uh, to your second topic. Are there questions? Yeah, maybe over there. Uh, Helmut Arden, this is a question to, to the whole panel. Do we see any, any smooth exit from the, from the current low interest rate environment or do we head for a disruptive uh, exit in the short or long run? So what? volunteering to that? I'm volunteering. It really depends on how it's done. Um, both is possible. Uh, we have seen both. It's a matter of communication and a matter of um, managing market expectations and uh, then um, how quickly uh, exits and normalization processes are done and many other aspects. So um, you can contribute to a more bumpy road or you can contribute to a smoother road. Both is possible. You know, probably every central bank will try to do any exit as smoothly as possible. Yeah, I, I would add one observation. It is not the central banks, basically, that determine this low interest rate level. It's really the real economy that produces low real rates. And we haven't seen so low real rates any time in the last 50 or so years, as we observe now. The question is, where, what's the reason for the low real interest rates that we observe in the economy? And that we probably don't know. Yet. Let me turn it around and say, who would be against a smooth exit? Don't look at me. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> but, but, at the, uh, but, but at the same time, and it's a kind of a, this is a very, very general question, because it's one thing when it comes to uh, exit in terms of what um, central banks in very large countries do, but when that happens, then things happen in other parts of the world as well. And, it, and, and then in other parts of the world, what really matters when these things actually evolve is to what extent you other macroeconomic imbalances have been kind of hidden because there has been easy money for a long time. And then you get back to sort of traditional issues like uh, too much uh, borrowing abroad, 
huge uh, current account uh, deficit and things like uh, things like that. So, so um, no one is against a smooth exit, but most likely there will be a few countries out there in other parts of the world that can end up in difficulties. But that's not due to the exit per se. That's probably more because they have other macroeconomic imbalances that they need to deal with themselves. Talking about exit, there would be a question uh, which is on the top of, of my list, but I, I try to listen to your questions, please. Hermann Remsberger, uh, I have uh, two questions to Governor Ingves. The first, uh, what can the euro system learn from the macro potential framework in your own country, in, in Sweden? Uh, and the second one, is there a chance that uh, Sweden will opt in the single supervisory mechanism. Thank you. Uh, on the first question, uh, nothing, because we are behind schedule <laughs> when it comes to our own macroprudential framework, so we have to learn from others. Uh, when it comes to opting in, that's entirely a political decision, and, and this time it wasn't possible to do it because there was a strong political feeling that the decision-making framework uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't acceptable. And uh, whether that uh, will change in the future or not, I just don't know. Okay. Any further? Maybe the last uh, question. So Hello I don't. There. Is there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hello, Edward Bowles from Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, do you agree with Jürgen Fitchen's remarks last night? And I'll paraphrase them regarding Commissioner Barnier's structural reform proposals that they are neither necessary nor helpful. And if you do disagree, how are those proposals consistent with serving? global corporates' needs, particularly those of German corporates overseas. Specifically addressed to whom? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who wants to be the first panel? I'm, I'm going to take a buy on that one. Um, I, unfortunately, we report into a lot of these regulators. Criticizing them would not be to my benefit. <laughs> Good. Any? You don't report to regulators. So. I don't report to regulators, that's correct. Um, it's the same point in time. Uh, where it's, uh, re bashing regulators is, uh, is fancy also currently, of course, right? So let's also be a little bit careful here what we're doing. It. Having said so, when you look at corporates, yeah, it falls into two segments today. Those corporates that are cash rich, and quite frankly, they don't care. Yeah? And those that are cash demanding, and those do care quite substantially, of course. And for them, it has been much more cumbersome. So in that sense, I would concur. Yeah. Good. Uh, then uh, maybe once again, uh, coming back to my last uh, question. Uh, it's about uh, also uh, some area we might uh, see an exit uh, in the future. And the question is, do we need risk weights for sovereign debt? Yes. 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 Definitely. And when will we see the first uh, risk weight to, to that? Good <laughs> Good it will take several years, at least. Okay. Good. Uh, we are close to the end, but nevertheless, uh, we have a few minutes for uh, starting a sentence uh, and uh, getting your, uh, let's say, uh, closing uh, to that. Maybe I start uh, with Arno Gerken. Um, a level playing field will be hopefully achieved quite soon, um, latest at the Soccer World Championships. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gran, also the same question to you, a level playing field will be? A level playing field will hopefully be achieved soon all over Europe, uh, applying same rules to all institutions and uh, with a, as little national differences as possible. And that also relates a little bit to the, to the credit cycle story that we heard over, uh, before. It should be level on a level. Otherwise, our idea of bringing the market discipline back into the industry will not work. Uh, if I pick up a question, a different one. Uh, clearing houses, they should be supervised by? Clearing houses? Um, I Not at all. Hmm? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I agree. Not at all. <laughs> um, and maybe coming back to the, the level playing uh, field. Uh, 
Uh, yes, a level playing field is desirable, but not any level playing field, uh, because it only will work if we have minimum standards that are sufficiently prudent. Of course, of course. And Omrad? Same, same question. Now, level playing fields are so important that every market participant has a fair chance and that things which are equal are treated equal and which are not equal are not treated equal. Well, so thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, seen uh, some uh, hopefully uh, interesting, to some extent also controversial uh, discussion. I think there's one theme uh, which at least I, I took. Uh, this was uh, basically we, we did see a lack of transparency, therefore we had a lack of trust, uh, and therefore we need to, to basically uh, get a lot of things, uh, be it on the banking, on the asset level, as well as on the uh, supervisory level, uh, our act together. And therefore, I think you have uh, the rest of the afternoon getting also some other insights uh, for me. I once again would like to thank you uh, to you uh, asking for questions, but even more uh, to the panelists uh, for sharing your time with us. Uh, and thanks very much. And I think now you have deserved a break. Thank you thank once you. again. Thank thanks. you. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks.